alcohol. What impact is alcohol having on your body? Are there really health benefits to drinking or is it all a bunch of nonsense? Well, today we're going to be looking at five ways that alcohol negatively affects the body. You will not want to miss today's video. Make sure to stay tuned. Hey guys, very quickly, just before we get into the video, if you want to get access to a free video training that shows you how to control your drinking without AA, willpower, rehabs, therapy, then make sure to click the link in the description. There'll be a short video for you to watch that explains how to apply first principles thinking, and it really breaks down a lot of the mistakes that most people make that fail to stop drinking. So click the link in the description for instant access to that training video. Now, ladies and gents, before we actually get into today's topic, I need to make one thing clear. The purpose of today's video is not to scare you. If scare tactics actually did anything to help us, then we'd probably all be sober. Now, if you want to skip ahead to the five ways that alcohol negatively affects the body, there are timestamps in the description below, but I do urge you to listen to what I'm about to say. Now, the point of today's video is to actually give you some balance. Balance against the constant brainwashing that you've been exposed to probably for your entire life, from the media, the alcohol industry, and just society at large. Now, alcohol manufacturers spend around $2 billion a year in advertising advertising, and that is just in the US alone. But the thing is, they get most of their best publicity for free, from mass media that are often all too happy to get their message out free of charge. For example, just take a look at this headline. One small glass of red wine a day could help avoid age-related health problems like diabetes, Alzheimer's, and heart disease, study finds. Now, most people aren't going to look past the headline and they'll just go on to the next story. And they just assume that the study in question did exactly what it said on the tin. Namely, it took a group of people who drank a glass of wine a day and tracked their health outcomes. But turns out that's not the case. And if you ended up reading the whole article, the text is deliberately confusing. You see, it hardly talks about red wine per se. It talks about Reservatrol, a compound found within red wine. And the whole article more or less is about Reservatrol and its supposed health benefits. There is also no direct link to the study being discussed. But I actually went and looked up the original research paper. And I've linked to it in the description if you want to check it out. The title of the paper is Search Winds Transduce STAC Signals Through Steroid Hormone Receptors. Okay, so there is no wine in the study, nor are there any humans. The study looked at cell cultures in a Petri dish, and it studied a class of proteins which interact with resveratrol. So in other words, it took a bunch of cells in a Petri dish, did all sorts of things to them, and then measured the biochemical outcomes. There was no wine, no drinkers, nobody who saw their heart disease improve, or their Alzheimer's or their diabetes. So what you have here is an example of completely unjustified and frankly outrageous reporting. From some interesting results in a Petri dish to the preposterous claim that wine protects against heart disease. Now, this story in the Daily Mail was the first one that I came across when I searched for wine health benefits. I didn't even have to look hard to find this type of reporting. Now, that's because the vast majority of these kinds of media stories are spun, and they're one of the go-to methods that media use to spin alcohol is talking about resveratrol, or some of the supposed miracle compounds that you find in grapes or wine. Now, the simple truth of the matter is this. If you want the health benefits of resveratrol, then you can buy it as a supplement. There is no need to consume the toxic ethanol as well along with all of the sugars, the flavors, the dyes, and all the other junk that you get in most wines. Now, the scientific literature on the adverse health effects of alcohol is vast. There are literally tens of thousands of scientific research reports. When you go ahead and take all of these collectively, you end up with one of the largest research projects in history, done with real-life humans who consumed real alcohol, and they lived to see the real-world health consequences. So this means that you don't need to make any ridiculous leaps from petri dishes studies to humans. But you see, the media hardly ever reports this mountain of evidence. It's not a very sexy story, and it doesn't mesh with the alcohol narrative of our brainwashed society. Now, because this literature is so vast, it's impossible to cover it in one video, or even to summarize it. So what I've done is I've just picked a few of the more interesting points. Some things that I believe that it's fair that every drinker should know about after spending their entire life brainwashed about the supposed health benefits of moderate ethanol consumption. So without any further delay, let's get into it. Now, the first way that alcohol negatively affects your body is your liver. Now, you've probably heard about the link between alcoholism and liver cirrhosis and you've probably seen photos like this. But what you didn't know is that cirrhosis is actually the end stage. 
It's the last in a long process by which alcohol damages your liver. And for most of this process, alcohol eats away at your liver quietly without you even realizing it. Now, the liver literally has dozens of functions within our body. One of the most important functions is breaking down and getting rid of toxins in your food and drink. So the liver is the primary organ that breaks down or metabolizes the alcohol that you consume. And as it breaks down the alcohol, it generates dangerous byproducts. In other words, there's no safe way for your liver to get rid of ethanol. And one of the most dangerous byproducts is called acetaldehyde. This is actually far more toxic than the alcohol itself. The liver then has to produce even more enzymes to break down this acetaldehyde so it doesn't get a chance to do any damage. But with repeated drinking, no matter how hard your liver tries, the acetaldehyde manages to do the damage. Now, alcohol is also destructive to the liver because its metabolism generates free radicals. To fight these free radicals, your body needs antioxidants. But chronic consumption of alcohol depletes your body's ability to generate antioxidants. This leaves your liver even more vulnerable. The metabolism of alcohol also starves your liver of oxygen. And without oxygen, the rest of the liver can't go about its normal tasks. The combination of all of these processes, the acetaldehyde, the free radicals, and the low oxygen, eventually overwhelms your liver's ability to cope. And as I mentioned, cirrhosis of the liver is the final stage of this process. It's the end game. But that being said, the damage starts far earlier and unfortunately without warning signs. The first stage is what's called fatty liver disease. Your liver literally stores up excess fat and swells in size. If you do get symptoms at this stage, they are generally mild. For example, fatigue or a vague feeling of abdominal discomfort. But you probably won't get any symptoms at all. Fortunately, for most people who stop drinking, this fatty liver disease can be reversed. Now, the next stage is more serious. It's called alcoholic hepatitis. At this point, the liver becomes inflamed and starts to develop scar tissue. This stage of liver disease can be life-threatening. On the positive side, your body at this point is giving you clear signals that you need to stop drinking. You start getting pain, your appetite starts getting messed up, and you start becoming fatigued. And the telltale sign is that your skin sometimes changes to a yellowish tone. If you stop drinking at this point, there is still a good chance that you'll be able to reverse the damage and live. Now, the final stage is cirrhosis of the liver, which we've probably all heard about. The scar tissue becomes so extensive that the liver can no longer function normally. The symptoms can be absolutely dreadful. More or less, every single part of your body is affected in some way. Now, unfortunately, at this point, the scar tissue is so extensive that the damage can't be reversed. But the human body has such a fantastic capability to preserve itself that more than one out of two people who stop drinking at this stage will still be able to live. Now, women are actually thought to require only one half to one quarter the alcohol consumption of men to damage their liver, which is also bad news. Now, one correction to something that I just said a few seconds ago, that cirrhosis is the last stage of liver disease. There is actually one more stage, and this affects many other organs, not just the liver. So we'll be giving that point special treatment in point five, so make sure to stay tuned till then. Now guys, the second way alcohol negatively affects your body is in your GI tract. After the mouth, the first part of your body to come into contact with alcohol will be the gastrointestinal tract. This is home to countless microorganisms from hundreds of different species of bacteria. They make up your so-called intestinal flora. And we understand very well that this intestinal flora is necessary for a healthy digestive system and overall well-being, which is why there's such a massive market for products like probiotic supplements. Unfortunately, alcohol can disrupt the regular balance of these microorganisms. It literally changes the ratio and destroys the balance between the quote, good and bad intestinal bacteria. With sufficient consumption, alcohol can also increase your gut's so-called permeability, where the barrier between your gastrointestinal tract and the bloodstream is compromised, allowing toxic molecules to enter circulation. This is what you'll sometimes hear referred to as leaky gut. Scientists believe that alcohol does this by attacking the cells that line your gut. It either kills them directly, or it disrupts them through acetaldehyde and free radicals, much like it does with the liver. It also destabilizes the bonds that hold them together, allowing various substances to pass through them. Now, all these excess bacteria that is stimulated by alcohol and leak through the intestinal barrier eventually make their way all over the body. So they trigger your body's immune and inflammatory response in various organs which then leads to systemic inflammation. This can manifest in various ways, for example, inflammatory bowel disease or IBD, and it can also affect your liver and nervous system. So you end up with leaky gut, 
chronic inflammation and autoimmunity. Now, the third way that alcohol negatively affects your body is in your fertility. Now, we all know that pregnant women shouldn't drink. They risk serious harm to their unborn baby. But what you probably didn't know was that alcohol can seriously damage a woman's chances of getting pregnant in the first place. Heavy alcohol consumption lowers women's so-called ovarian reserve. This is the fancy name scientists use to describe their fertility potential. According to some studies, Women who consume five drinks a week have a 60% probability of getting pregnant compared to non-drinkers. For those who drink over 10 glasses a week, this percentage falls to around 34%. Women who drink more often are also more likely to seek medical help for infertility issues. Now, what about men? Well, drinking affects male fertility in a number of ways. For starters, it can mess up with their sexual function. In male inpatients treated for alcoholism, around two-thirds to three-quarters have some sort of sexual dysfunction, be it loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, or even both. But alcohol also damages sperm. It actually changes the morphology of the sperm cells. Their heads break, their midsection becomes distended, and the tail curls. Sperm concentration also drops, along with total semen volume. Given all of this, it's probably no wonder why men who are heavy drinkers are often over represented in infertility clinics. Now, the good news is many of these sperm parameters can recover after drinking stops. Now, guys, the fourth way that alcohol negatively affects your body is when it comes to your mind. Now, can you remember the acetaldehyde that I've mentioned before, which is the byproduct of alcohol metabolism that we saw earlier, the one that's toxic to your liver and your gut? Now, one of the organs that it has a special attraction to is the brain. Some of it is metabolized directly in the brain from the alcohol that makes it there. The rest reaches it from outside the central nervous system after crossing the blood-brain barrier. Once in the brain, it is thought to contribute in part to the characteristic loss of volume that we see in people who chronically abuse alcohol. You see, the brain of heavy drinkers literally shrinks in size. The first site to shrink is typically the cerebellum. This is the structure at the back of your head. Eventually, the atrophy spreads to more and more sites until eventually the entire brain is affected. Encouragingly, this shrinkage and atrophy of the brain is thought to be reversible if the drinking stops. Now, drinkers are also at a higher risk of developing various rare neurological conditions. Now, as you'd expect, this deterioration of the brain is reflected in drinkers' cognitive ability. Compared to non-drinkers, Heavy drinkers are more likely to have impaired cognitive function, and they also tend to experience more rapid cognitive decline as they age. And the problem is that once your cognitive functioning is impaired, stopping drinking can become even more difficult. To make a calculated, logical, and educated decision to stop drinking, you need to be firing on all cylinders. When your cognitive ability slips, your ability to assess things and make judgments suffers. So the cognitive decline that alcohol causes can unfortunately also damage one's chances of stopping. And guys, at number five, we've got cancer. Now, plain and simple, alcohol can give you cancer and it's really not up for debate. The evidence is now so overwhelming that the medical community considers it fact. Now, the government also considers it a fact. According to the American Society for Clinical Oncology, and I quote, alcohol drinking is an established risk factor for several malignancies. An established means beyond dispute. According to the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, quote, consumption of alcoholic beverages is known to be a human carcinogen, based on sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity from studies in humans. And I've linked to both of these documents in the description below. And the figures that we'll see now show that it's not just heavy drinkers or quote, alcoholics that run a risk. Even one drink a day can increase your risk of developing certain types of cancers. Compared to non-drinkers, light drinkers have an increased chance of developing cancer in the mouth, the esophagus, and for women in the breast. On top of these, moderate drinkers also have a much higher risk of developing liver and larynx cancer. Remember that when we were talking about the liver before, and I mentioned that cirrhosis is sometimes not the end stage? Well, now you know what the end stage can be. Heavy drinkers have an even higher chance of developing all of these types of cancers. For the mouth and esophagus, this is about five times higher than a non-drinker. For the liver, it's more than two times higher. Now, guys, as I said at the start of the video, the point here was not to scare you, it's to educate you. It gives you a little bit of balance against the constant brainwashing that you're exposed to all of your life. That consuming a toxic substance like ethanol served up in a bottle or a can, along with hundreds of other industrial chemicals, is somehow beneficial to your health. First principles thinking is about seeing things clearly. It's about approaching drinking logically and breaking it down to its component parts. It's not about fear, but you can't use first principles if you're working on faulty assumptions, which is why it was important for me to make this video. Now, I do want to close things on a positive note. If you're an average sized person, 
your body metabolizes alcohol at the rate of 7 grams per hour. This is roughly one drink every two hours, meaning that after a day or two, at the most, no matter how much you've drank, there won't be a trace of alcohol left in your body. It will be gone, and if you've made the decision to stop drinking, it will be gone forever. And this means that your body can go about repairing and rebuilding itself. Studies find that within a year of stopping drinking, organs like the heart and the brain will have largely recovered from the damage. So in other words, it's never too late to stop. Hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day.